Good morning. Let us talk about the bandwidth principle and its application to smooth and short transition in open channel flow. Let us look at a situation where we have an open channel flow from left to right with a horizontal seal as seen here in the middle of the channel. What would be the water depth over the seal? And what would be the downstream water depth? Another question could be this vertical sluice gate. As a flow path underneath the vertical sluice gate, what will be the free surface profile immediately upstream of the sluice gate, called A, B, or C, as well as what will be the free surface profile downstream of the sluice gate, D, E, or F? Herein, we are going to focus on open channel flow for smooth and short transition using a one-dimensional, incompressible, steady flow approach. For such a smooth and short transition, we will apply the Bernoulli principle combined together with the continuity principle or conservation of mass. Let us remember that the Bernoulli principle is derived from momentum considerations. And it is applied within some key basic assumption it is applied along a streamline for a frictionless fluid on an incompressible flow. Additionally, today we will focus on a steady flow, but the Bernoulli principle in its broader form may be applied to unsteady flow. So looking at this crossing on the top with flow direction from the right to the left, we will be able to apply the Bernoulli principle in the in approach flow condition on the flow above the crossing, but definitely not downstream because energy dissipation takes place there. The application of the Bernoulli principle for a steady flow along a streamline states that the sum of the pressure plus rho gz with rho the fluid density, g is the gravity acceleration on z the vertical elevation positive upward plus rho v square over two, equal a constant with v, the velocity along the streamline. In open channel hydraulics, we tend to use a death integrated form of the Bernoulli equation, which can be written as d cos theta plus z naught plus v square over two g equal a constant, where d is a water depth as shown on the bottom right sketch, Theta is the angle between the horizontal and the channel slope. That knot is the bed elevation, and V is the depth at large velocity. This expression of the Bernoulli equation that we commonly use assumes implicitly hydrostatic pressure. And of course, we will combine the Bernoulli principle with the continuity equation, which states that BQ the total discharge, equal V time A, A being the cross-section area. And this equation, of course, is valid in absence of lateral inflow. So if we looked at an application for a horizontal rectangular channel, so cos theta equal one in horizontal channel, the Bernoulli equation on the continuity equation will state that D1 plus Z01 plus V1 square over 2G equal G2 plus Z02 plus V2 square over 2G between section one and two being located upstream and downstream of the particular transition that we are considering. On the continuity equation, we state that V times D times B, where B is the channel width, is a constant. On the illustration on the bottom here, uh, show a uh, upward step in a channel with a photograph of the experiment. In this slide, as in the previous slide on forthcoming slide, you will see that there is a URL to a YouTube video movie developing more on this type of application. And regularly for the course, I will try to share with you some URL that you may wish to look to have a brief video clip on a particular section of this material. Let us now introduce two key definitions in open channel flow. 
The first one is a total head. It's the same definition as we use in pipe flow, but in the context of an open channel flow, we can express the total head as a sum of d cos theta plus z naught plus v square over 2g. And hence, the Bernoulli equation for a smooth onshore transition will imply that the total head is a constant. And in the total head, the first expression on the right hand side is related to the pressure work. The second term is linked with the potential energy. And the third term is linked with the kinetic energy. The second key definition is the specific energy, big E. By definition, the specific energy equals the total head minus the bed elevation, H minus Z naught. In other words, the specific energy is a total head using the bed, the local bed elevation as a datum. And hence, we obtain E equal D cos theta plus V square over 2G. When we have a flat rectangular channel, as illustrated on the top right, we can combine the definition of the specific energy with the continuity equation, and we obtain a flat rectangular channel, the specific energy, big E, equals D plus small q square over 2g d square, where small q is a unit discharge or discharge per unit width. So in the next few minutes, we are going to look at the relationship between the specific energy, the water depth, and the unit discharge. First, in a situation where we have a fixed unit discharge, and we focus on the relationship between E and D. And next, for a fixed specific energy, looking at the relationship between small q and d. So, let us assume that we have a constant unit discharge. We then have a relationship between the specific energy and the water depth, which is in fact a cubic equation. Cubic equation, which is plotted on the right-hand side, with the horizontal axis being the specific energy, the vertical axis being the water depth. And that's, of course, here is for a flat rectangular channel. We can see first that we have two asymptotes, the horizontal axis and a dashed line D equal E, or a one-in-one -one slope line. When the specific energy is less than the minimum specific energy, there is no solution. This could be a situation where the water depth is below the crest elevation of a spillway, and there is no flow through the spillway. When the specific energy equal to the minimum specific energy, we have one solution, critical flow condition. On or larger specific energy, we have two possible flow depths. In this expression, and in this relationship, we see a key characteristic location, the minimum and specific energy, which are technically called critical flow condition, and for which the specific energy is called E min, or minimum specific energy, and the water depth is called a critical flow depth. As I say, the definition of critical flow condition is when the specific energy is minimum, such a condition corresponds to a flow singularity because there's a unicity in the flow depth for a given specific energy. And we can express the water depth as a function of the discharge as well as the cross-sectional characteristic free surface width and free surface width. For a rectangular channel, we can derive the expression of the critical depth as dc equal cubic root of small q square over g with the minimum specific energy being equal to 1.5 times dc, the critical depth. For a channel of irregular cross-section, it's a little bit more complicated, on critical flow condition fulfills the following relationship, 
1 minus BQ square over GA cube over B equals 0. And the water depth B that fulfill this relationship is the critical depth. With here, A being the cross section area, measure perpendicular to the flow direction, and B being the free surface width, again, measure perpendicular to the flow direction. Another application is, of course, a vertical sluice gate. At a vertical sluice gate that we can consider in first approximation as a smooth onshore transition with an illustration here of a video. The, we are in a situation where the specific energy is greater than the minimum specific energy. And the water depth upstream of the gate would be the largest of the two solutions. And the water depth downstream of the sluice gate is the smallest of the two solutions for a given specific energy. These two solutions are called alternate depth. And here on this video, the injection illustrates some of the streamline of the, as the flow path underneath the sluice gate and is accelerated. Among these two alternate depth, the solution corresponding to a water depth greater than the critical depth is called the subcritical flow depth, and that is the definition for sub critical flow, while the water depth is less than the critical depth, the flow is said to be supercritical. And these are the key definition of sub and supercritical flow. We often introduce a dimensionless number called the Reich fraud number in open channel flow. And for a flat rectangular channel, most people would be familiar with the definition of the fraud number being equal to the ratio of the velocity to the square root of g times d. When we have a flat, irregular channel, the definition has to be adapted on the fraud number equal to the velocity divided by the square root of g times the ratio of the cross-section area to the free surface width. With this definition, and only with this definition, the Reich fraud number equal to one unity at critical flow condition. We may also introduce the celerity of a small disturbance. For example, let's assume we drop a pebble in a reservoir and ripples will propagate on both sides of the impact. This ripple will propagate with the celerity of a small disturbance relative to the local flow. And that celerity is equal to C equal square root of G times A over B, result obtained at the end of the 18th century by the French mathematician Joseph Louis Lagrange. And in turn, we can see that we can express the Reich Fraud number as a dimensionless ratio of the velocity of the flow to the celerity of a small disturbance, expression that is analogous to the Mach number whereby supercritical flow will be analogous to supersonic flow. And that analogy has been indeed used in the early 20th century to study the propagation of shock wave in supersonic flow using channel like the one you see on the bottom right, where we see all the shock wave at the surface of a supercritical flow. But let us talk now about hydraulic controls. That is, if we have a irrigation canal on the top right, where should we put a gate? If we have a spillway, like at the bottom in the middle, where should we put the gate? In a subcritical flow, small disturbances can travel both upstream and downstream. And we can demonstrate that such a subcritical flow is best controlled from downstream. That is for an irrigation canal shown on the right, we will typically place a control gate at the downstream end of the canal. On the other hand, when we have a super critical flow, small disturbances can propagate only in the downstream direction. And thus, such a super critical flow is only or can only be controlled from upstream. For a spillway, we can, where the flow will be typically super critical flow, we can only control the flow by introducing some gates at the upstream end or 
using critical flow condition at the spillway crest. On relevant application, now not only the control of regulation device on spillway version, but also in terms of the numerical integration. Now, let us look at the relationship between the discharge on the water death for fixed specific energy. We obtain a relationship between the unit discharge, small q, on the water death shown here, with its expression being plotted on the right, with the vertical axis being the dimensionless water death, d over e, the horizontal axis being the dimensionless unit discharge. We find in particular that we obtain maximum unit discharge at critical flow conditions. An relevant application could be flow constriction or culvert barrel that we typically design at optimum for an optimum design at design discharge to achieve critical flow condition in the culvert barrel. Let us, call, let us talk also about channel contraction and channel expansion. When we have change in channel width, we will typically, for a rectangular channel, use the dimensionless relationship between specific energy on water depth, shown here and plotted on the right, where the vertical axis is now the ratio of D to DC, and the horizontal axis is the ratio of E to DC. And for a rectangular channel, irrespective of the channel width, there's one unique relationship shown in blue. And the effect of the channel width is accounted for in the definition of the critical depth, dc equal cubic root of q square over g b square. And of course, like we have seen before, the flow is subcritical flow when d over dc is greater than one, supercritical when d is over dc is less than one, and when it's critical, it's potentially shocking. Importantly, we need to remember that for a rectangular channel, any change in width must fulfill the Bernoulli equation, e over dc equal d over dc plus half of dc over d square. And of course, when shocking takes place, it could potentially yield some change in the upstream specific energy. Let us look at a couple of applications of the Bernoulli principle. First application could be a change in bed elevation with constant channel width. It could be a downward step as or drop shown on here. And if we use the Bernoulli equation on in the form of the graphical relationship between specific energy and flow depth, we can see from these two examples, two different patterns. On the top, we have a subcritical inflow condition. And thus, the drop in bed elevation will correspond to an increase in specific energy. On the downstream water depth, will have to be also subcritical or greater than the inflow depth. On the other hand, the lower sketch, show super critical inflow. An increase in specific energy will lead to a decrease in the water depth. So the downstream flow condition will also be super critical and D2 will be less than D1. We can do or we can apply the same reasoning to an upward step, which will correspond to a decrease in specific energy. And in this application, one of the key message is that the a smooth on channel, a smooth on short transition is strongly affected by the upstream flow condition. And we may obtain for the same boundary condition different downstream condition, depending whether the upstream flow condition are sub or super critical. Another example is a broad crested wheel over which critical flow condition takes place and which can be used as gauging device and critical flow meter. In practice, we typically derive the discharge based upon the upstream water depth, which is usually easily, more easily measured than the water depth at the crest. On the application of the Bernoulli equation, give us this relationship, Q of small q equals Cd times two over three 
square root of 2 over 3g h1 minus z crest cube. In real fluid flow, there might be some losses, and we will introduce a dimensionless discharge coefficient, typically equal to about 0 0.98 to 1 for a broad crested wheel. For a circular wheel, we may have similar relationship, but this time we have dimensionless discharge coefficient typically greater than one because we have non hydrostatic pressure or non uniform velocity distribution at the crest of the wheel. One need, however, to be careful that the relationship between dimensionless discharge coefficient and absolute head is not necessarily unique on a series of uh, measurements done worldwide by a number of colleagues. I've shown that there is a range of upstream head above which we may start to develop some hysteresis, which are directly linked to nonlinear instabilities. Finally, and before we look at two applications, let us remember that the Bernoulli equation was developed upon some key basic assumption, and it applies only to smooth and short transition in open channel. The Bernoulli principle should not be applied outside of these assumptions. Some relevant reference, including a YouTube channel. And let us look now on application. We have a short transition with a contraction on a change in bed elevation. And we are told, knowing the inflow condition on the boundary condition, to calculate the flow property at section two and section three. So here we have a smooth and short transition. So we will apply continuity on Bernoulli principle. We will neglect energy loss and we will assume a hydrostatic pressure distribution at section one, two, and three. First, we are going to look at the inflow condition. Are they sub or supercritical? We are given an inflow depth of 1.3 meter. The upstream critical flow depth is 2.6 meter, and hence the inflow is super critical flow. We can calculate the upstream specific energy on, on the dimensionless relationship between specific energy and water depth. We can see that our own flow conditions are on the lower branch of the relationship. Next. Let us look at, let us calculate the flow condition at the crest. First, we apply the Bernoulli equation, which tells us that H1 equals H2 is constant total head or smooth on short transition. We can then derive the specific energy at the crest. And for that specific energy, there are two alternate deaths on the key equation, which one is the correct one. We can calculate the critical death at the seal. 3.12 meter. Hence, if we, on, we have a relationship E2 over DC2, which is 1.7, which is shown for the, uh, on the bottom graph, we are still on the lower branch, very likely, because we are not going for a critical flow condition. And in turn, to satisfy the Bernoulli equation between section one and section two, we need to travel on the dashed line from one to two, from blue to red dots. And the only solution is lower alternate depth, D2 equal 2.17. So the flow is super critical on the seal. For the tail water condition, again, we apply the Bernoulli equation, H1 equal H2 equal H3. That gives us the specific energy at the downstream section, for which we have two possible alternate depths. We can calculate the ratio of E over DC, and that ratio is not critical. In fact, on the graph, we can see that the tailwater condition are shown in green. So as we move to the seal to the tailwater condition, we will move on the dashed line from the red dot to the green dot, sorry. And we have supercritical tailwater conditions. So in summary, the flow condition are shown here on sketch on the top. We have basically supercritical inflow leading to supercritical flow on the entire structure because we are not going for critical flow condition at the wheel crest. Our second application is a vertical sluice gate. 
we are given uh, some information about uh, the maximum discharge. And we are asked that, first of all, to predict the, char the correct face surface profile. And secondly, when we have laboratory condition which, for which we can measure the upstream and downstream water depth, to deduce the model discharge on the corresponding prototype discharge. First, let us look at our schematic. Let us remember that the free surface is a streamline, and that's how we are going to solve the free surface profile. At the upstream end, upstream of the gate, we follow the streamline of the free surface, and as it reaches loose gate, there is a location which, for which V equals zero. It's a stagnation point. And according to the Bernoulli principle, a stagnation point V equals zero will lead to a higher water depth to fulfill the Bernoulli principle. Then we will follow downward the inner wall of the sluice gate. And at the bottom end of the sluice gate, the streamline needs to be tangent to itself, as there is no stagnation. And in turn, we need to have a curved profile as seen on the graph in the right curve. In terms of solving quantitatively our problem, we will apply the continuity and Bernoulli principle for this smooth and short transition with the equation shown here. We neglect energy loss and we assume hydrostatic pressure distribution as section one and section two. The equation being here, we know that we know the upstream and downstream water depth. In turn, we can express the Bernoulli equation in terms of the total discharge, which become, or which give us, sorry, a direct analytical relationship between the total discharge, PQ, and the upstream and downstream water depth, D1 and D2. On, for all this application, we find a model discharge of about eight liter per second. If we want then to predict the corresponding prototype discharge, we need to remember that we are dealing with free surface flow and gravity effects are important. Thus, we will typically use an undistorted fraud similitude with a geometric scaling ratio of 50. The scaling ratio for the discharge would be the scaling geometric scaling ratio at the power 2.5. And in turn, we obtain a corresponding prototype discharge of 140 cubic meter per second which is less than the maximum capacity, design capacity of the sluice gate. Of course, when we do physical modeling, we need to ensure that we minimize scale effect, and in particular, that's our prototype will operate under turbulent flow condition. We need to ensure that the model flow condition will also be turbulent, typically greater than five to 10,000. And here, for this particular laboratory test, the model Reynolds number will be of the order of 20,000. So to sum up, the correct face surface profile are A and F, shown in right on the sketch. Our model discharge will be 8 liters per second. On our full scale prototype discharge will be 140 cubic meter per second. 